Good evening. Um, my name's Deb Marr. I'm a professor at the Indiana University South Bend in the Department of Biology. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's um, Our Universe Reveal Lecture Series. Um, this is a partnership between the University of Notre Dame, <coughs> Indiana University South Bend, and then the St. Joseph Public County Library. Um, and we're really pleased to bring to you a series of talks um, about different areas of current research that's going on in this area. Um, and it's just, an, and this year actually we're going to be bringing in a little bit of music and arts into the series. And, um, and it's an opportunity to explore really cool topics, um, learn a little bit about ourselves, our world, our universe. We literally explore other galaxies. Um, so a wide variety of topics. Um, so this year, um, to start off the series, um, it's my pleasure to, um, we'll be having uh, Felipe Santiago Torado, uh, and he um, did his PhD, so his doctorate work at Cornell University, in which he focused on cell biology. And then he took a really cool course at, one, at Woods Hole, uh, which is in Massachusetts, which is one of the world-renowned research centers, and dove into the world of fungal pathogens. And ever since then, he's been into fungal pathogens. Um, he did his postdoc and was working as a research scientist at Washington University at the, uh, their School of Medicine. Um, and then he's been at the University of Notre Dame for the past five years. Um, and he's going to take us into this really, uh, fungi are really unusual creatures. They have kind of cells that are similar to ours, which make them some of the most difficult infections to treat. And, um, and so anyway, he's going to take us into this wacky world of fungi and what they do. So I will let you take it away. Okay. Well, thank you there for inviting me for this and, you know, to the organizers. Uh, I'm very happy to come and talk about uh, this, the, the Last of Us. Uh, I'm guessing that most of you know this either from the HBO uh, TV series or maybe from the game that this is based upon. And, but if you haven't watched it, just to give you a very quick uh, overview of it, this is just a post-apocalyptic uh, world where society has been decimated by a fungus that infects humans and turn them into, for the lack of a better word, into zombies, although they're not zombies, they're like infected people. Um, and amazingly, the show has caused a lot of, of commotion and a lot of interest in, in the general uh, audience about fungal infections, mostly because they're thinking, the, the question I get the most, they're thinking is like, can this really happen? You know, they're thinking about that. And so I thought this was great. You know, fungal infections have been neglected for so long, so I, I thought this is the perfect opportunity to shine a light uh, on them. Uh, and well, I'm here to answer these three questions in here. Basically, could this really happen? Can fungi turn us into monsters like this? Uh, and regardless if the answer to that is yes or no, I want to talk about should we be worried about a fungal pandemic? You know? uh, and then lastly, even if we should be worried or not, if we were to get a fungal infection right now, you know, today, can we treat it? Would we be able to treat it and cure it? So those are the three main questions I want to answer uh, tonight in the next you know, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, so to start, I want to uh, talk a little bit about fungi, because for most people, uh, if I talk about, if, if I ask them, what do you think when you hear the word fungi, most people associate fungi with mushrooms, actually. Uh, these plant-like things that grow in nature. Uh, but then if I say fungal infection, not just fungi, but fungal infection, some people may associate that phrase with plant and crop diseases. You know, uh, some of them, you know, corn smut down there on the bottom left, uh, potato blight, which was responsible for the uh, uh, the Irish potato famine that then drove 
uh, millions of Irish immigrants into the, into the Americas, you know, strawberries, rice, many ma tomatoes, many of these are very important crops. And, and plant, fun, uh, plant uh, fungal plant pathogens actually uh, are responsible for 90% of all of the crops uh, diseases. And, and I went to the Department of Agriculture website and I found that every year, you know, fungal plant pathogens, they're responsible for between 10 to 25 percent loss of crops, which is worth between 200 and 300 billion with a B, you know. Uh, so clearly, fungal infections are already having an impact in here. But if I go a little bit further and say, well, let's just talk about human fungal pathogens. Most people think on this superficial infection that are mostly cosmetic. You know, you're like, oh, you know, a little bit uh, cosmetic, but you don't die of them. You know, you don't die of scalp infections, you know, skin, nail infections, you know, at least foods, thrush in babies, which is pretty common, especially when you're using antibiotics. Um, you know, yeast uh, infections of the genital area. I think that's what people think when they talk about f uh, human fungal pathogens. And these things, you know, you don't die. These things will not turn you into a zombie. Uh, but generally speaking, when people think about fungal infections, they don't imagine this. You know, so this in here, this patient in here, in sub-Saharan Africa has cryptococcal meningitis, a brain infection. This person in here has pneumocystis pneumonia. This person in here just received a stem cell transplant and he's infected with Aspergillus. And this uh, elderly here in a nursing home just caught Candida auris. So these are invasive fungal infections that can kill you. These are life-threatening fungal infections. Meningitis, you know, brain infections, pneumonia, you know, infections of the lungs. Uh, and when you, most people, when you hear the word fungal pathogens, they don't think about brain infections. They don't think about pneumonias, but they do happen. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is because those fungi that can cause those infections, they're microscopic. They usually look like this. They can either be yeast, which means they're unicellular, they're just a single cell. This is actually similar to baker's yeast, you know, the yeast that people use to make bread, wine, you know. This is one type of budding yeast that cause uh, invasive infection. Or they're molds, like Aspergillus in here. And this is how they look when you grow them in the lab. Uh, so these are the fungi that cause life-threatening infections. And, and collectively, these fungi, they cause 300 million infections every year. Of those, 25 million are severe. They're invasive fungal infections. And yet, you know, people don't usually associate fungal infection with such high numbers of deaths. Uh, and of those 25 million, 1.6, that 1.6 will not make it, you know, 1.6 million deaths yearly. You can see here, most of them caused by these three fungal uh, genera here. And so that, you know, those are real, you know, big numbers. And, and I think that's the real threat of fungal pathogens, that they can kill, they can kill easily. And there's very few antifungals. There's very few effective treatments. And so all of that, those numbers, the fact that there's very few treatments, led the World Health Organization, the WHO, recently to publish their first ever priority list of fungal pathogens, where they're like listing the, the fungal pathogens that represent the higher threat to public health. And on the top, on the top priority were these four. Cryptococcus neoforman, Aspergillus fumigatus, and then the Candida species. And as you can see here, those are the ones that cause most of the infections. And to make matters worse, cases are increasing. And like I said, there's very few antifungals. The ones that we have are all toxic, or they're very expensive. 
and they're so expensive that they're unavailable in places uh, like Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia, where the incidence of these infections is the highest. So, so in those places, uh, having a, a, a diagnosis of one of these invasive fungal infections is like a death sentence, equals like a death sentence. So depending where you live, the mortality from these infections is anywhere between 20% here in the U.S. to like over 81%, like in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, like I said, this, getting one of these infections is like a death sentence. And I think for the longest time, they were kind of neglected. The general public, the government, you know, funding agencies, they were not thinking a lot about this. So I'm actually very happy in a way that fungi are getting their 15 minutes of fame, like in the last year or so, they have become uh, a thing in popular media. In, in pop culture, and in part is because of this TV series, The Last of Us. So with that, I want to go a little bit into the show and, and tell you what, what is real, you know, what they got right. First, the fungal pathogen in the show is based on a real fungus. Uh, it's a real fungus that do turn insects into zombies. It's called the Cordyceps uh, genera, and this is an example of an ant infected by it, and you can see the fruiting body, the hypha of that uh, fungus coming out of the brain of the ant. And, and if you look a little bit, if you, if you read a little bit about the show, you'll see that uh, the original creator of the video game, he basically got his idea watching a David Attenborough story, you know, story about, about you know, life, and he saw some videos about it. Uh, so they, that's, that's true, that's correct. And not, not just ant. This uh, series of fungi, they can infect insects in general. You can see spiders, you can see sea cattle, you can see worms. Um, and the whole point of this is that it's just about survival and spreading. So the fungus infect these insects and it hijacks their central nervous system. And what it does is that it forces them to go high. They want to go high on a tree. You know, they want to have the high level. In this particular case here, that ant went up that branch, and then with its claws, it hold itself there. Then the fungi start growing out of the ants and then releases spores to infect all the ants that are down below. So that's, that's the whole point of it. So in that way, you know, they're like, puppeteers, you know, they're controlling the movement of, of those insects. So in that sense, you know, brain infecting fungus that alters behavior, like in the show, it does happen. It does happen in real life. Uh, it's just restricted to insects. It doesn't happen in humans. That, that's not going to happen uh, for many reasons that I'm going to talk about later, but it is based on real behavior. Now, having said that, I mentioned before that Cryptococcus neoforman, for example, one of those invasive uh, fungal pathogens I mentioned, does infect the brain. It does infect the brain, and it does alter the behavior. You know, people get disoriented. They, they can, you know, they can you know, show altered behavior, but it's not like they become you know, puppeteers of every movement. Uh, another thing that the, the, the show got right, and I'm, I'm very glad that the show, I, I was actually very surprised and happy when they showed that, is the effect of climate change on pathogens. So at the beginning of the show, the, actually the, the prelude to the show, is this uh, scientist talking to a, a talk show uh, commentator, and they're talking about like viruses and, and the potential of, of viruses to create a pandemic. And then and they're discussing you know, what's worse. And then one of the, the, the doctor on the, on the left in here, he's a mycologist, and this is a virologist, and they're discussing which one is worse. And then while they're discussing that, you know, I, I actually went and put that on video and I wrote what they were talking about. While they're discussing one, he's claiming that, you know, fungal pathogens are worse, and he says no. And then he says that, you know, fungal infections of this kind is real, but not in humans. Then he said, True, fungi cannot survive it hosts, uh, if the host's internal temperature is over 94 degrees. You know, we all have you know, 98, 97, 98 degrees. 
So Fonya will not be able to survive inside us. But then he goes and says, what if? If the world were to get slightly warmer, now there's a reason to evolve. One gene mutates, and now ergot, candida, aspergillus, cordyceps, any one of them could become capable of borrowing into our brains, taking control for one reason, to reproduce and to disseminate. And so I like that because there is already one example of a fungal pathogen that's the, that has been I don't want to say created, but it was turned into a pathogen because of climate change. And so I want to highlight two things now. Fungi cannot survive if its host internal temperature is over 94. So there's one reason why we humans, during evolution, we're very resistant to fungal pathogens. And it's a thermal barrier. That thermal barrier, we're too hot for them. You know, Fungi are uh, you know, adapted to live in the environment. They're adapted to like room temperature. So that's one barrier that we have. We have another barrier, which is why we're, traditionally we were very resistant, and it's our immune system. We have a very strong immune system. But what had happened? So, you know, in the last decades or so, human intervention is weakening or eliminating both barriers. So with climate change, pathogens are adapting to grow at higher temperatures. So we're reducing that thermal barrier that we used to have. Now medical advances, which is counterintuitive, medical advances have actually make us susceptible to fungal infections. Why? Because now we have steroids. You know, steroids are used to treat inflammatory diseases. That means that steroids will downregulate your immune system. It will make that barrier, that immune barrier, weaker. Organ transplants. We didn't have organ transplants in the past. Now they're pretty common. And for you to not reject the organ, they have to immunocompromise you. They have to remove your immune system. They're removing that barrier. So for organ transplant patients, fungal infections are a pretty big problem. Uh, there's, of course, HIV, the advent of HIV. Prior to HIV, fungal infections were very, very rare. But in the 1980s, all fungal infections, they skyrocketed, and doctors didn't know why until they found out about HIV. So we, we evolved to be very resistant to fungal pathogens, and, and, and that resistance is wavering right now, which makes them more of a threat. Okay, so, so going back to, to these questions, could this really happen, like, you know, like in the show? No, very, very, very unlikely. Not, 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 not like in the show, at least. Uh, but should we be worried that a fungus could cause a worldwide pandemic? Uh, I'll say yes. Why? Because they do have the potential to cause a disease. And it's already happening. I'll have a few examples. It's already happening. So I think that we should be worried. Uh, one example, amphibians going extinct. Uh, you know, in, in, this was first reported in 1988. Scientists realized that many amphibian species that have previously been very common, abundant, you know, very easily and reliably encountered in, in the wild, now they were just disappearing for no obvious reason. And it took almost a decade to figure out that it was a fungal infection that was driving the largest extinction recorded to a single disease. Uh, you can see in, in here, this figure in here, every, you know, all this circle in here, all these red and purple lines, those are species that have gone extinct because of this uh, fungal infection of amphibians. Uh, no, in, in this uh, scientist reported uh, talking about that extinction, he was saying scientists did not believe that a fungal pathogen could affect hundreds of species. But in fact, the nightmare story is true. And why? You know, many reasons, but again, one of them, climate change, habitat loss, change in the, you know, hum 
humid nights, a lot of evaporation, drives more rain, uh, changes in the amphibian ecology. Well, it has resulted in, in extinction of a big chunk of the amphibian biodiversity. And the fungi responsible is called, you know, the name is pretty long, so you know, we just call it BD and BSOL. They're chytrid fungi. They look like this. They live in you know, the spores. They're, they're in the water. Amphibians, they're usually in water. And they basically, those uh, spores, they basically want to eat keratin, which is in, you know, keratin in the skin of the amphibians is a great source. Uh, so they go, that's why you see in here, all the skin is peeling off. It's basically, it's been eaten by, by the fungus. And, and I talk, remember I talk about these two barriers, the thermal barrier and the immune barrier? Amphibians are cold-blooded. They don't have thermal barrier. So they're very susceptible. Uh, and then I want to highlight that there's no cure, no treatment. Uh, and that's going to become a common thing, sadly, as I talk. There's no cure, no treatment. Another example of uh, something big that's happening due to uh, fungal infection is the white nose syndrome decimating bats in, in America. It was first detected in New York in 2006, and now it's basically present throughout all the U.S. and all five provinces of Canada. And just like uh, the chytrid fungi, this fungi also eats the keratin on the bat's wings. So over here, you'll see normal bat wing, and then this is the, the wing of a bat that has in, been infected. You can see how it's been eating the wing. And, and then dead or dying bats, you'll see that they have like a white fuzz around their noses, and, and that's basically the growth of the fungi coming out of the body of the, of the bat. And that's why it's called white nose syndrome. And very recently, there have been several studies looking at the effect, the economical effect of these of bats, and it was determined to be almost you know, half a billion every year. Because you, know, you might know these bats are very important for agriculture. Uh, but more than that, this has resulted in bat populations crashing, you know, which is also terrible, like for insect control and things like that. Um, and again, no cure, no treatment. Now, the interesting thing about this is that bats are mammals. They're warm-blooded like us. So they should have that thermal barrier. But what happened? Bats hibernate. When they go in the winter into a cave to hibernate, they lower their metabolism and their temperature goes down. So now they don't have that thermal barrier. That's when they get infected. And in fact, what happens most of the time is that the fungi start growing in the nose and then they cannot breathe. They wake up from the hibernation and then they fly out of the cave and they freeze to death. So now they can get infected in the summer months. They have the thermal barrier. It's fine. It doesn't do anything to the bats. Again, the importance of that thermal barrier. Now, the third and, and last example I want to tell you now, you know, I went from amphibians to bats. Now I'm in humans. This is going on right now, and it's the spread of Candida auris, mostly on healthcare facilities. So Candida auris was first reported in a patient in Japan in 2009. It was an ear infection. That's why it's called auris. That's Latin for, from ear. And the first case here in the U.S. was reported in 2016, but retrospectively, people realized that there were cases even before, yet there were very few cases. If you look at the CDC map of the cases that were reported, in 2016, uh, there were 53. 53 reported. Now, the very concerning thing is that Fast forward, you know, 2022, there were almost 10,000 cases, and now the map looks like that. So not only a massive increase in the number of cases, but now the geographical areas where these have been seen has also increased. It's mostly urban centers like New York City, Houston, Chicago, and it's mostly, you know, nursing homes, healthcare facilities. But it is very concerning. You know, it's not yet... It's not yet like big numbers, like I mentioned before. It's not like worldwide, like I mentioned before. But it is concerning. Why? Because of this, you know. 
this study was looking at the number of strains that are resistant to the only three antifungals that are clinically available. These are the only three antifungals that are clinically available. And if you look in here, 80%, 80%, 85% of the strains of Candida auris are resistant to these antifungals. And I know, the, I already told you, these antifungals are not great. They're very toxic, you know, they're not very effective, but it's the only thing that we have. And now this strain of Candida auris is resistant to these, uh, to these uh, antifungals, so it is a superbug. And this is a superbug that uh, was driven to become a pathogen because uh, it's proposed because of climate change. And I can talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, here, yes. So it wasn't a pathogen before 2009. And interestingly, researchers have been looking at banks in hospitals to try and see if there were uh, previous strains of Candida auris that were bank, you know, hospital banks, and they have found several. And then when they compare those with the newer ones, those that were prior to 2009, they could not grow at 37 degrees. They could not grow at 98 Fahrenheit. But the newer ones can. The other thing that uh, scientists realized is that it started in Japan, but it simultaneously appeared in all five continents. And when you look at the genetic sequences of these strains, they're not the same. So it's not like one person got it and then traveled the world and then spread it. These things appear simultaneously everywhere. So what was, you know, it was suggested that the reason that drive this was climate change. It's just adapted. Why? Because Candida auris live in wetlands. And then you can have global warming, you can have industry throwing like hot sewer into those wetlands, and so the temperature in here is increasing. So eventually you're gonna select for the one that now can survive a higher temperature. Now there's, birds have higher body uh, temperature. They're, they're 42, which is probably like 100 something Fahrenheit. I'm sorry, I don't think in Fahrenheit things. <laughs> But now, Candida auris can survive. And then bears can spread it around, especially to rural areas where there's a lot like, of farming, there's a lot of interaction between birds and humans. And now humans can get exposed. Then because of that movement of from rural environment into an urban environment, now you're bringing those uh, strains into an urban environment. And they're very difficult to get rid of. They're very difficult to kill. And so, uh, for example, in hospital and, or nursing home or healthcare facilities, uh, you know, they're very hard to get rid from surfaces, for example. And, and what happened? You know, they got adapted to high temperatures, so you broke that thermal barrier. But who are in these healthcare facility. It's not healthy people. People who are in these healthcare facilities are usually sick. That means that that second barrier, that immune system, is not working well. So you lost, you have lost those two barriers. So going back to that last question, uh, which relates to everything I have said so far, um, can we, you know, should we be worried? I will say, yes, we should be worried. Why? Because really, we don't have an effective way to treat these infections. Uh, there's no cure or treatment for, for that ketid fungi. There's no cure or treatment for the white nose syndromes. There's very few ineffective treatments for human ones. And now there's uh, fungal species that, are being, that have evolved that are even resistant to the few. That, uh, that exist. Uh, so can we prevent fungal infections or at least treatment? You know, we can't prevent them. There's no vaccine. Nobody has ever been able to create a vaccine for a fungal infection uh, and treat them very poorly. And I want to very quickly tell you why they're so challenging to treat. And Deb already mentioned a little bit of this, is that fungi and our own cells are very similar. People think of fungi, like I said at the beginning, people associate them with mushrooms, associate them with plants, with nature. But when you look at the tree of life, you know, if you look in here, fungi are closer to us 
than they are to viruses or to bacteria. Look how close they are. They're next to each other. So that means that they're very similar to our own cells, and so that makes, makes it very difficult to find or target something that's very specific on the fungi versus something that's in our own cells. So, so here's an example. This is how a virus, a gene genetic virus, look like. This is how a bacteria look like. You know, the virus is basically just this protein capsule, a protein circle with some DNA or RNA inside. The bacteria have more organelles, but it's very simple. But if you look at an animal cell and you go at a fungal cell, look, we shared almost everything. We shared with both eukaryotic organisms. We shared almost everything. So invariably, if you decide to like target something in the fungi, more likely than not, you're also targeting in yourself. So that's why those antifungals are so toxic. It's very hard to find something that's very specific. So if you look at the current, at the current um, classes of antifungals, what they're targeting is either is one or three things. So this is a fungal cell in here, and the fungal membrane that surrounds the cell has a lipid called ergosterol. And that's only present. It's only present in fungi. So pharmaceutical industries say, oh, let's target that. And so many of the antifungals that exist, they're targeting that. They're targeting ergosterol. Now, it turned out that ergosterol is almost identical to cholesterol. We have cholesterol. So the concentrations that you have to use of antifungals to kill the fungi invariably will also react with your own cholesterol. And so it will poke holes in your own cells and, and you know, it's going to be toxic. So that's why you know, there's very, they're very toxic. They're not very, uh, uh, very uh, specific. Another thing I want to say is that fungi are relatively new pathogens. It's not like you know, the blood plague or you know, TB or these very old diseases that have been studied for hundreds of years. Fungi basically started you know, in the 1980s with HIV and with medical advances. That's when they became very you know, big pathogens. So they're relatively new. We still don't know a lot of it. There's also less interest by authorities. You know. Why? Because most people that get infected with these deadly fungi, they don't transmit people to people. So they're not communicable. So you get infected, the fungi is growing inside of you, but the person next to you is not going to get infected. So I think that, and also, because they've been rare so far, they will not be profitable. So, can we prevent them? No. So I think this is why I highlight that I think that we should be worried. So if a fungal outbreak were to start and become widespread, we don't have a way to treat them. So, are we doomed, you know? We, no. We don't have to be, you know, we're not doomed. We don't have to be completely, like, without hope. I actually want, like I said at the beginning, you know, I actually like that fungi have become so mainstream in popular culture because it's highlighting, it's raising awareness of it. Also, most, in, most invasive fungal infections are in, right now are in low-income country. Why? Because that's where the biggest incident of HIV is. Here in the US and in developed countries, they're still very rare, but they are increasing. And why? They're increasing because of medical you know, advances that are only present in these rich, rich nations. Uh, I think that pop culture, you know, the TV shows, the video games, the podcasts, you know, the WHO report, are shining a, a, a spotlight on fungal infections in a good way. You know, now governments are taking attention, funding agencies are taking attention. Public awareness is increasing about it, not only about fungal infections, but about the ways climate change can impact us you know, indirectly. You know, a lot of it is because of climate change. I also mentioned immune barriers. That's very important. So it's also raising awareness of the importance of healthy lifestyles. And most importantly, I think it's going to be good for uh, you know, all scientists because 
it highlights the importance of continuing investing in basic research because knowledge is our best defense to diseases, including fungal ones. And, and you get that by, by uh, trying to do, you know, understand how they cause disease. And, and because of that, you know, I'm very happy to say that in the past few years, pharma are taking attention, and there's actually several antifungals in the pipeline. This is a list of antifungals that are in phase two and phase three, and you can see that they're treating all sorts of different invasive fungal infections. So uh, hopefully, you know, all of this attention is gonna result in newer, better fungal infections, and then we will be prepared should a pandemic happen, you know? We will prepare. So it's not, we, there, we're not doomed, there's, you know, there's hope. <laughs> Okay, so with that, I think I'm just gonna finish in here. I'd be happy to answer, you know, entertain some questions. But before that, you know, I wanna like give a shout out to my team, and you know, and this is my my team in here. And then I do have collaborations with other labs at Notre Dame, in mainly the Flores Mirelle lab. This is an actual catheter from an actual patient that was full of fungi. And basically, we're just trying to understand how they cause disease. With the idea that if we understand how they cause disease, then we can intervene, we can you know, block or do something. Okay? Well, I hope that you, know, you enjoy that, and I'll be happy to take questions. Yes, okay. Um, I have two quick questions. One, do you think that the increase in fungal infections is related to COVID? You showed that data from 2022. And with the HIV correlation, I was wondering if that's a possibility. Um, and then the second question, has the increase in fungal infections in humans correlated at all with antibiotic resistance as well? Yeah, so those are great questions, and, and yes, some of that increase is due to COVID, and I tell you why. After we figure out that COVID was mostly driven by this inflammatory response, this excessive inflammatory response, the way that people were treating COVID is with steroids. They want to bring your immune system down so that that way you can control COVID. But by doing that, they're making you susceptible to fungal infection. So a lot of patients in the hospital that were being treated by COVID, they were at the same time being diagnosed with fungal infections. Yeah. And then the, your question about the resistance is, 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 I think it's common sense to think that way that you know, they're both correlated, but they're not. So with bacteria, bacteria can very easily change and share their DNA and move resistance around. Fungi don't do that. But what happened with fungi is that they were already inherently, they were already resistant to these uh, antifungals, but they were not pathogens, you know, because they were not able to grow at temperature, high temperature. They were already resistant. And, and one of the, the ideas about that is because the crop pathogens I talk about, those crop, you know, fungal pathogens that affect the crops, those same Antifungals that are used in humans, they are used in plants to prevent the, the fungi to destroy the plants. What happened? Most fungi are in the soil everywhere. And so you're spraying these crops to kill the, the fungal uh, crop, fungal pathogen, but then the, the one in the soil that is not a plant pathogen, it's just living there, you're also killing it. So eventually that one in the soil becomes resistant. And then that's the one that is going to infect you. So that's, that's the idea. Yes. Um, I've seen on TV, uh, I'm not sure what type of light it is. It might be ultraviolet. They come in with a machine into a room and it, quote, sanitizes it. Does that have any effect on a fungus or not? Yeah, so UV light will cause mutations in DNA of every organism, you know, UV light will destroy bacteria, will destroy viruses, it will just destroy the DNA. But fungi, interestingly that you answered this, uh, several fungi are melanized. They produce melanin, this black pigment, like, you know, that's what makes you dark. The darker you are, the more resistant you are to UV light. So actually in Chernobyl, for example, right now in that, uh, in the reactor that exploded, that is covered in fungi. 
fungi are using that radioactivity as a source, you know, as melanized fungi. Uh, so fungi, certain fungi are even more resistant to that type of sanitation. Um, also, I want to say that, you know, going with a UV light and just light it for like 10 seconds, it's not going to do anything, you know. <laughs> you have to like put 15 minutes of UV light on a, on a surface to actually cause something. Uh, but it, UV light will, in, in theory, should affect any organism, but some organisms are more resistant than others. And fungi happen to be one of them. Yes. Yeah. What is the concern about uh, fungi becoming, uh, changing to be able to um, live in a higher temperature climate or body temperature? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the biggest concerns because fungi are everywhere. You're exposed to them all the time. And I think there's this idea that the reason that we are very resistant to fungi was because over evolution, uh, we were selected that way. That's why mammals, you know, they survive the many extinctions. Uh, so it is a concern that fungi are currently driving the extinction of so many other organisms, like the amphibians and like the bats. So it is very concerning that if they were able to like infect very effectively human, they can also drive the extinction of humans. But like I said, we have these two big barriers, these two big pillars that makes us very resistant. And as long as we have those two, which, you know, we should be okay. But the problem is that human intervention is destroying those two pillars. So we're doing it ourselves. Can, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, immune mechanisms that uh, attack, uh, uh, that, that the fungus? Uh, keep us safe from, uh, yeah. from exposure so, every day. So is it, is it the same mechanism that go after a uh, bacteria and virus? Is it antibiotics? Is it B cells and T cells? Yeah, yeah so the, it's the same immune system. It's the same immune system. But what happened is that uh, with fungi, you know, they're usually in the environment. Most likely what happens is that you inhale the spores of the fungi. And you have many barriers. You, know, you have mucus in your lungs. You have cilia in your lungs that move stuff around. So you, know, you inhale that and they, the cilia start, you get trapped in the mucus and the cilia start moving the fungus out. If it goes all the way in, then you have macrophages in your lungs that will identify them, you know, eat them and destroy them. Uh, if for whatever reason that fungi can pass that, then T cells and B cells can come into action. They can make antibodies against that, mark them, you know. So that's why, you know, the immune, the, our immune system is a formidable foe. It, we are exposed to microbes all the time and we're not sick all the time. So it's a very formidable, formidable foe. So it's the same system. That, it's just that some of these fungi have evolved ways to bypass that. If, especially if you are, if you have, uh, you know, some def defect like HIV, you don't have lymphocytes, you don't have T cells, if you have some other defect in your immune system, then they can take advantage of that. Yeah, oh, me? <laughs> Thank you for, for such a great talk. Um, we know that now urbanization is increasing a lot, the temperature, and there are a lot of organisms that have been shown to terminally evolve um, due to the selection pressure of a higher temperature within urban environment. Do you know if this is also true for fungus? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I mean, most of the, the only, is the only case that there is that's reasonably, and um, it's a reasonable hypothesis, this candida oris, and that happened in the wetlands. I, I, I don't think, I don't know of any example of something happening in, in like in cities because it's hotter or something like that. Uh, I do know, like some months ago, there was I saw in the news there uh, there's a, a a town where was it? It's like a, there's this whiskey fungus. There's a town that has like a distillery, a big distillery, and then the fumes from the distillery. Uh, now that town is just covered in fungi. 
like the trees, everything has this dark fungi, and it's a fungi that just basically evolved to use the fumes as an energy. So that's something that happened there because they have the distillery, and it's called now the whiskey fungus. But, uh, so there's clearly, there's clearly selection pressures that can happen in certain places, so I would not be surprised if something like that will ever to happen in, in an urban city. Yes. So it sounds like the, the fact that fungi aren't communicable is yeah. also another kind of barrier that they can't pass from person to person easily. Do you think there's a risk that we'll lose that barrier? Because that seems like what it would lead to a what would be necessary to lead to a pandemic? To create like a pandemic, yeah. So I think, I think that's one of the main reasons that they used to be neglected. People were not too worried about it. Uh, and the fact is, the, the reason is that when you get infected uh, with the fungi, it's usually the spores from the environment that you inhale it, and then the fungi grows inside of you, but it does not produce spores inside of you. So, so you're, you're not exhaling spores. You know, so that's why you cannot pass it. There's some evidence that, you know, for candida albicans, for example, there's some evidence that maybe you can pass it, you know, through sexual activity, but also it's not like viruses and TB, you know. But what I think that doesn't mean that it doesn't have the potential to cause a pandemic because they're everywhere. You know? Fungi are everywhere. If all of a sudden the fungi have an ability to cause disease, we we'll all be exposed to it immediately. You know, we inhale them every day, yet we don't get sick. But if now they were, we were to get sick, you know, it is, it does have the potential to be you know, catastrophic. Yes. So I have so many questions, but I keep it to a couple. Uh, so the, the example that you mentioned with the fungi that infect the, uh, the brain of uh, the insects, mm -hmm. and that's in, a, in essence a form of mind control. And I'm wondering if there's anything known on the, the chemical level of what is actually happening to, to change that behavior. Yeah. And uh, the, the other question is a little bit more philosophical is uh, something like uh, the example of toxoplasma uh, ch changing behavior of mice so that they can be eaten by cats, so that they're not afraid of cats, so that they can be spread more. It, so the philosophical part, I guess, is could we be already, you know, under some influence of some kind of control? <laughs> <laughs> I want to have 50 cats. Or yeah, yeah, that's it. No, no, that's great. I mean, I, I don't work with that specific type of fungi. So I'm, I know that that fungi evolved together with the insects, so the fungi know how to manipulate the insect. But, you know, the nervous system of the insect is very different from the nervous, for our nervous system. So they will not know how to manipulate those. But having said that, you know, if you think about many of the halogenetic, you know, the, the LSD and, and things, you know, many of these uh, drugs that make you, like, go high, many of them are produced by fungi. So they do, if, if you get infected, they do have molecules that can affect your behavior. And, and then your example with toxoplasma is great, you know, that happens, you know. And, and the whole point of it, like that scientist in the show said, the whole point of it is just to reproduce, you know, that's the whole point of it. So, so yeah, I, I don't know specifically about the cordyceps, but I do know that, uh, you know, it's not going to happen to us. <laughs> but, but there's many examples of compounds that affect brain behavior that are produced by fungi. Okay. 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 Thank you. <laughs> That was a, a wonderful talk. Um, this is just the beginning, guys. Uh, so just to give you a sneak preview of what's coming up this fall. So every month, the first Tuesday, 6.30 p.m., be here. Um, or you can get on the mailing list. So if you go to um, our Universe Revealed, University of Notre Dame, you can also get yourself added to the mailing list there so that you get notifications. So today, 
Felipe Santiago Torado. Um, so thinking about fungal pathogens. So October 3rd, we're going to think about the solar eclipse. And we have solar eclipses coming in October and then also next April. So you can get ready. And if you come, I think you can get glasses. Yeah. So, but you got to come. Uh, and then November 8th, this one's the mystery one. So this is the, a panel about the Nobel Prizes. They won't be announced till the first week of October. I have no idea what it's going to be about, but it will be fun. Um, and so last year we had uh, three people on the panel talking about the um, physiology, the uh, chemistry, and the physics um, prizes there. And then in December, we're going to dive into music. Um, so that's what's coming up. So I will leave you with October, and I hope to see you all back. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.